Our next part of the program is our guest speaker. And you see in your program that she's the founder and president of Save the One and co-founder of Embryo Defense. She's been an international pro-life speaker and adoption of speakers since 1995. And uh, I've heard her on several occasions. Uh, but I can tell you, the reason that there are no exceptions in the Texas law is due to a large part by the work that Terry Kiesling, uh, Rebecca Kiesling did with Governor Perry at that time and continue to do. She's still testifying before Congress. She's still active. Anytime somebody wants somebody to talk about why life is important, she's a person who very truly can say, I can tell you why lives are important because I am one of those lives. Please welcome Rebecca Keithling. who are just up here, you know, one day um, your children may be doing what I'm doing, <laughs> sharing their stories. Um, tell them I said that. <laughs> so I was adopted nearly from birth, and like many adoptees, for years I dreamed of being able to meet my birth mother. My search began on my 18th birthday, and I was shocked to have been told that the door was closed, that I would never have the opportunity to meet her, and that was very difficult for, for me. Uh, all these years I had this expectation, it was my information. And so I wrote a couple of poems my first year of college. The first is called The Option of Adoption. Pregnant, unable to support, not wanting to abort, you chose the option of adoption. Do you long to see your little baby? She is mature and grown. You wonder, has she known about you, the other father and mother? All that you went through, she still has never sent you a card on Mother's Day. But that is okay. She was not being mean. She only just turned 18. Now will she try to find you? Does she know it would not mind you? You ask, what does she look like? She was just a little tyke the last time you saw her crying in the arms of the lawyer. You wonder, what is her name? Oh, you feel such shame, though you let her live too. But does she forgive you? You hope she understood it was for her own good, in her highest interest to give her only the best. Unable to ever recover, you only wish to tell her you love her. And then my response is, I am living and forgiving. Of course I want to meet you. Give hugs and kisses when I greet you. I have waited 18 years and shed a thousand tears. Growing up without you, wondering about you, often I would tremble with no one I resemble. Do you have blonde hair, blue eyes? If you saw me, would you recognize that I was the tiny infant with whom nine months you spent? Do you really care for me? Or would you just ignore me because you are someone's new wife trying to forget a past life? Is daddy still around or does he also need to be found? I was told I've got a sister. Gosh, I really missed her. And what about my brother? Does he know about the other little sister he had? Or tis a secret for mom and dad? A family from a storybook, I imagine how you each may look. I am welcomed with open arms. In you, there could be no harm. I accept you as you are. You're the twinkle in my star. But my star, again, will not shine tonight. And still, to my dismay, you are not in sight. So I hope you can hear from that just how significant this was to me. I really believed that finding my birth family would help me find my roots, just like in Alex Haley's miniseries, and it would bring meaning to my life. Oftentimes I felt like the feather 
in the movie Forrest Gump, where he's just haphazardly, you know, floating around and it represented his life. And I thought that meeting my birth family would help ground me and I could find my value, identity, and purpose in life. I finally petitioned for what's called my non-identifying information. When it arrived, it had everything you can imagine about my birth mother except for her name. Her eye color, hair color, height, weight, age, the age of my half-brother and half-sister who were 11 and 13 when I was born, her ethnicity, religious background, occupation, educational level, detailed medical history. And I just hung on to every word. But all it said for my biological father was that he was Caucasian and of large build. And of course, I thought, that sounds like a police description. I mean, come on, she couldn't even say his eye color, hair color, nothing. And I thought it over. I mean, what could the possible explanation be? So I called my caseworker and asked her, was my mom raped? And she said, yeah, I didn't want to tell you. And I was just devastated. I remember feeling so ugly and unwanted, thinking who would ever love me. And of course, at the same time, I thought about the issue of abortion. Because that's what you always hear about, right? And it was as, like, as if I could hear the echoes of all those people who would say, I'm pro-life. Except in cases of rape. Or I'm pro-choice, especially in cases of rape. And I realized that all those people were talking about me, about my life. And I felt like I had at least half the world against me. I later learned from Gallup polls that of self-professing pro-lifers, 60% make the rape exception. So I have more than half of pro-life people against me. Now, growing up, abortion wasn't talked about a whole lot in my family. When I was 12, my 16-year-old cousin had one. And I recall the discussions being that this was not a good thing. When I was 13, my grandfather died. A year later, it was like the floodgates opened. And all of a sudden, my grandmother began to share this story that when she was pregnant with my aunt, who's the younger of her two children, that my grandfather had told her to go get an abortion. And she said, I never loved him again after that. How could they do that? How could they kill the babies? She cried for years sharing the story and she was so devastated that my aunt's daughter had aborted her first great-grandchild. But I think maybe if she had shared this difficult family story, maybe my aunt would have valued life more, maybe my cousin would have valued life more. And then in high school, at a public high school, I had a class where we studied this issue and I was part of a panel discussion and I took the pro-life side. And I remember classmates on my panel though, um, part of my team, came in with photos of aborted babies. And I was horrified, but I didn't place myself in those images. I thought it was just some sad story where she couldn't afford to keep me, but abortion doesn't apply to my life, I thought. And then I had wanted to be a lawyer since I was 10 years old. And I remember in high school, women in the community asking, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'd say, oh, a lawyer, and they'd say, oh, like a feminist. And I'd ask, well, what's a feminist? 
And they explain that it's like being a strong woman and fighting for women's rights and helping to protect women and make them stronger. And I had always been like an athlete and I was super strong. And I had always wanted to protect the underdog. That's part of why I wanted to be a lawyer. And I, so I thought, well, yeah, like a feminist. And then I started hearing that feminists supposedly support abortion. And I thought, what on earth does killing babies have to do with being a strong woman? I grew up in the era of hearing the mantra, I am woman, hear me roar. You know, and that Anjali commercial, right? You know, I can bring home the bacon. You know, it's this idea of that you can have it all. You could do it all. You could be a mom, be a wife, have a career. But the abortion mentality says you can't. And instead of I am woman, hear me roar, you have to be afraid of a baby. And you have to understand why women would be afraid of a baby. How is that being a feminist? True feminists say, when, when a woman comes into a pregnancy center and says, I just can't have this baby right now, a true feminist says, you can have this baby. I believe in you. You are stronger than you think, and I will help you. These other women, they, they just exploit women, which is just absolutely unconscionable. So, in high school, I just figured, I just won't have one. Beyond that, it didn't affect my life. But then I turn 18, and all of a sudden, it affects my life in a very big way. One of the first things I did was I looked in the phone book under Right to Life. That was a phrase I had heard, and I called the local Right to Life office because I just wanted to speak to someone who valued my life. And the woman on the other end of the, of the phone spoke words of value into my life at a time when I was really hurting. And then I asked my adoptive parents, well, how do you feel about abortion? And what about in cases of rape? My adoptive father started to say, well, I've always felt like, who am I to say what woman can or cannot do with her own body? I guess I'd have to say I've always been pro-choice. But dad, you watched me grow up. You raised me 18 years. You really mean to say that you really believe that my birth mother's body, her choice, was more important than my whole entire life? Like, really, Dad? That temporary situation, you, you really believe that? And it was like he instantly snapped out of it, and he said, no, I don't believe that. Wow, how would I ever get to a point where I would believe such a thing? And then he started to talk about how, as a professor, on a liberal campus, that it was just expected that if you were progressive-minded, you would be pro-choice. But he had never stopped to consider the ramifications of that position, particularly as an adoptive father. So I learned at a minimum at 18 that my story had the potential to change hearts and minds, but I still struggled with those big-picture worldview questions of who am I? Why am I here? What is my value, identity, and purpose? Because society would tell me I am a product of rape. The rapist created me. And so I needed to find out, you know, who I was. Well, I ended up struggling in relationships. Like, I should be thankful that somebody would want to be with somebody like me. I got to more and more abusive relationships until eventually I was beat up by a boyfriend from law school. He 
broke my jaw. My front tooth was hanging. I had to have all kinds of surgery to have it put back in, root canal, more surgery to try to save it. I was told I could still end up losing my front tooth someday. And after 13 years, I had to have it pulled, which was devastating. But I was speaking at a pregnancy center fundraiser in Alabama, and an expert in cosmetic dentistry came up to me afterwards, one of their board members, and offered to do all of my teeth for free as part of the Give Back a Smile program. For, for victims of domestic violence. And he didn't just do three teeth with the bridge and a fourth to match, but he did eight teeth with porcelain veneers, so... <laughs> story with you because it is another example in my life where there was something that happened that was really really awful but then something beautiful came out of it and isn't that what God is famous for the worst evil that man has in store, God can take and use it for good, for his glory. It's the story of Joseph in Egypt. When his brothers sold him into slavery, we're told what man that for evil God can use for good. And it is the story of our Savior. And the story does not have to end with the violence having victory. But as we're told in scripture, God trades beauty for ashes. Well, I am very thankful for this nice new set of teeth, but let me make one thing clear. That does not make me pro-domestic violence. <laughs> right? <clears throat> Just like being thankful for my life does not make me pro-rape. But people say that all the time. Like, they've seen that sign on Facebook and it's been reported as violating community standards because they say that I'm promoting rape. There's people who say that if you, kill, if you cared about your birth mother at all, you would have killed yourself a long time ago. I get called a rape apologist. And how dare you say you love your life, you're pro-rape. And especially on university campuses, they'll say it to my face. And I explain to them that there's, and they'll say, oh, so what you're saying is if abortion had been legal, you wouldn't be here today. Well, you know, if your birth mother had been raped, you wouldn't be here today either. So does that mean that you're pro-rape? Huh? And I explain to them that there's a huge moral difference because I did exist. And my life would have been ended because I would have been killed through a brutal abortion. I may not look the same as I did when I was four years old or four days old yet unborn in my mother's womb, but that was still undeniably me and I would have been killed. It's a huge moral difference. And I also explain that, look, you can be pro-law enforcement, but not pro-crime. Even though it's true that if it weren't for crime, there'd be no law enforcement. <laughs> That's the logic they use. And they'll say to me, oh, but that wouldn't have been you. Well then, who would it have been? <laughs> oh, it just wouldn't have been you yet. Okay, so I'll ask students, you know, let me see a show of hands. How many of you have seen the ultrasound photos? in your baby book. And I asked them, well, what do your parents say? Do they say, like, I don't really know what that is. Like, I don't know, it's some kind of glob of tissue. Like, I don't even know what it's doing here. No, your parents say that was... And the students finish the sentence. They get it. They know that was me. But then all of a sudden, when it comes to the issue of abortion, these same people will say, oh, but that wouldn't have been you. And that is complete intellectual dishonesty. 
Well, when I had been beat up, I had really hit rock bottom. From all outward appearances, I had so much going for me. I excelled in academics and athletics. I was attending a great law school, but I was completely deteriorating on the inside over this whole issue of value. And that is when Christ called me back to him. Now, the first time I'd ever heard the message of the gospel, I was 15. I had been adopted and raised in a Jewish family. I went to five years of Hebrew school three days a week. I was bat mitzvah and everything. But God was wholly irrelevant in our household. I never saw my parents pray. My classmates would remind me that I wasn't really one of them. I was called a bastard. And when I was 12, I had a friend invited me to Mass for Palm Sunday. Um, Francesca Freshier. <laughs> and it was at Dun Scotus, which was a friary. And I remember that there were like monks up there. And I, like, I asked, like, who are they? And, and she said, you know, all oh, their monks, they have the vow of silence. And I remember thinking, oh, that's really spooky. <laughs> yeah. Just like in the movies. And when it came time for communion, I asked her, what's that? And she said, it's kind of like crackers and juice. <laughs> and so everybody stood up, and I stood up with her family, and she said, you can't have any. <laughs> and I asked, why not? She said, it's because you're Jewish. And I thought, oh, it's true. Everything I learned growing up, they really do hate the Jews. <laughs> they won't even let me have crackers and juice. <laughs> because she didn't share her faith with me. Neither did her family. She just thought it was cool to invite her little Jewish friend to church one day. And then in high school, I had a friend who invited me to hear a special youth speaker who laid out the message of the gospel. I had never heard this before. Trust me, Jesus is not a popular subject in a Jewish household. <laughs> and I believed, and I knew that this was like an act of war in my family. I mean, I may as well have told them I had joined the Nazi party. So many of my family members, great grandparents, great aunts and uncles were slaughtered in the Holocaust. And, you know, I grew up from a young age knowing that there's such hatred which exists in the world, that there are those who would kill innocent others. And so for my parents, this was a total betrayal. But after about nine months, I no longer had a ride. Um, I felt forsaken by my church friends. And I ended up spending some of the most difficult years of my life learning how I was conceived, ending up in abusive relationships, and I was away from God, away from church, until he called me back. And again, it was one person who invited me to Mass, who shared their faith with me. And when I went through RCIA, the before we had the rite of welcoming, the very first scripture, the very first day that we were introduced to, was how it's in the spirit of adoption that we're called to be God's children through Christ. That was revolutionary for me. Because my adoption story growing up was infertility centered. I knew that my parents would, have, would not have wanted me if they didn't have to. And so to hear that adoption is not second best, last resort, only the infertile, but that it's meant for the body of Christ and a picture of God's love for us was transformational. And I've learned so much through scripture that, you know, the rapist is not my creator, that I was created by God in his image for a purpose, which, by the way, was not to be aborted. 
One day I was in my church parking lot and uh, this woman who I'd seen for years was really upset that they were doing a petition drive on abortion. And we started to have a conversation and she brought up about cases of rape and I shared my story with her. And she was like still really angry and so I asked her the most intelligent question you, you could ask which is, um, appealing to someone who goes to church all the time. Um, did God not create me? And she sat there and thought about it. I'm like, what are you thinking? You know, like, where in the Bible does it suggest that Satan creates children? And she says, all right, I'll give you that. <laughs> wow, okay. Credit where credit is due, you know. God and I, thank you. Um, and then I asked her the next important question, which was, and did God not create me for a purpose? And again, she thought about it and then replied, I just think that God might create some people for the purpose of being aborted. Oh. No. No, he created me for good and for not evil. Like, oh, yeah, these beliefs are alive and well on Sunday mornings. We get called, my people group, all kinds of names. You know, evil seed, demon seed, Sean Hannity interviewing my friend Lila Rose, he said, I just think that's an evil seed. And then he doubled down and said, doesn't the Bible say that the sins of the father will be passed on to the child for the third and fourth generation? Actually, it says that the child shall not be punished for the sins of the father. Each will be punished according to their own sins. And then there was um, Bishop Paul Morton Jr., um, a black pastor at a, at a huge convention, luncheon of a couple thousand, got up on stage and said that the, um, he denounced the Democratic Party for the position, but he said, but the Republicans have taken it too far. He's like, you mean to tell me that a woman's pregnant with a, a demon seed? And then he says it again, a demon seed, not what God created? What? It's a pastor saying that God doesn't create all children. Are you kidding me? <clears throat> and um, so, you know, I knew at 18 that I was forever in a position where I would have to justify my own existence and I would have to prove myself to the world that I shouldn't have been aboard and that I was worthy of living. And about five years ago, I got an email from a young woman demanding that I tell her, she says, what good have you done in your life to justify what you did to your mother? And I explained, you know, first of all, I was not raping my mother. I was innocent. I plead my innocence. And she said, well, I just have difficulty knowing that great babies like you exist. But the thing is that she was just verbalizing what so many people think. And she actually gave me the opportunity to respond. And we went back and forth, and I, I know my value now. I know my worth, and it, it's not my accolades. Okay, it's not my successes or my failures. If you want to actually know my worth, I'll point to the cross. Because that's the infinite price that was paid for my life. That's my worth. It's not the good that I've done. But I, you know, I did go through some of the work that I do and, and helping rape victims and their children and terminating parental rights of rapists as an, as an attorney, all the advocacy I've done. And, 
Um, I even quilt and you know made quilts for her. Um, and she ended up changing her mind on this issue and apologized. So I'm grateful that I had that opportunity. Um, but I also wanted to know how my birth mother felt. At 18, I wanted to know maybe there was some mistake. This is not how I was conceived. And I had a judge who allowed my caseworker to try to contact my birth mother and see if she wanted to meet me, and it worked. I was attending college out of state at the time. I finally received a letter with my birth name, which was Judy Ann Miracle. So I was a miracle baby. <laughs> I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> and it had her name, her phone number. I called her up. She said that she was sorry to hear I already knew, but then she filled me on, on the horrific details. She's 4'10", really petite, single mom, heading to the grocery store at night right down the street from her home. She was abducted at knife point by a serial rapist. And that was so hard to hear um, for so many reasons. But she sent me this beautiful letter Afterwards, we arranged to meet, and she wrote, My dearest Rebecca, hoping by now that the shock of finding out all the details of your birth are forgotten. For that was not reason enough of having to give up something as beautiful as you were, nothing as precious as a baby. Mostly when you go through the nine months in the birth all alone, feeling like no one loves you. But you were so perfect and pretty. All these years, I had nothing of you, nothing saying you were part of me. Just the memory of carrying a baby that I hoped one day would try to find her real mother, as I always wanted to know my baby. You were always with me, my thoughts. You were always with me, my heart, mostly in July. It seems like a lifetime, I know. When I was sick two years ago, I thought I would never get to know my little girl. Would you please see if you can get me a copy of the letter you sent to the Oakland County judge? It made me cry. Also, I would like copies of your poems. These are things I would like to read. It's been a long three weeks looking forward to our meeting. I didn't know how to express my inner feelings. And she put in caps, it's so great, big, beautiful. It's always been my dream. I am so happy I'm crying. And she wrote closing, a love that ate at me for 19 years. My daughter at last. With love, your mom, Joanne. That was... dreams come true. I felt so offended. I felt like, yes, I was wanted. We had a wonderful reunion weekend with her. She had a huge family reunion for me. But after that, I went to college, went back to college, went to a few meetings of Students for Life, got the courage to call her two weeks later and ask her about abortion because I still needed to know. And she told me that if it had been legal in Michigan, she would have aborted me. She said, even if she had to do it all over again, you don't know what it was like. It should have been my right. And despite the horror of her saying that to me, I chose to nurture a relationship with her, to honor for the role that she did play in my life, hoping that if I could prove myself good enough, she changed her mind. Well, she changed her mind six years later when my niece was in an unplanned teen pregnancy in Florida with her first great-grandchild. Remember I told you my grandmother lost her first great-grandchild? Well, when we met, my birth mother sent me a five-generation photo. She sent me three five-generation photos. She has one when she was a baby with her great-great-grandmother. And that meant something to her, that this was her, that there would be another five-generation photo. Interesting how that changed her heart. And so now, decades later, she's so thankful that we were both protected from the horror of abortion. Um, she actually went to, to two illegal abortions, and I was almost killed. She said the first, it was the typical conditions that you hear about. Blood and dirt on the floor and on the tables and those conditions and the fact that it was illegal caused her to back out. It was an OBGYN's office. She had to go through the back door. And then it was arranged to go to a more expensive abortionist. 
to, she had to meet someone, she was to meet someone at night by the Detroit Institute of Arts next to a replica of Rodin's famous thinker statue, which is from a greater work of art called The Gates of Hell based upon a passage of Dante's Inferno that warns all who enter here that there's no going back. And she expressed concern, oh, they were going to blindfold her, put her in the back seat of a car, take her somewhere, abort me, blindfold her again. She said that if there were any complications or if she was further along than thought, they would have to keep her overnight. And she was terrified for her safety, but prepared to go through with it. She spoke with this abortion doctor on the phone the night she was to kill me. Expressed concern for her safety, he called her stupid. She said, you're going to swear at me, forget it. Well, then he, he got really irate, and she finally hung up. He called her back the next day. Same conversation took place. That one was $750. The first one was $500. I know the time, place, manner, how much money was on my head. All the details of my impending death. There's a documentary film used in feminist studies all over the country, the only one for decades. It's called Back Alley, Detroit. I can watch it and see the men who are going to take my life. And that was my life-changing near-death experience. And the fact that I was younger doesn't make it any less real or any less significant. And to be clear, I wasn't lucky. I was protected. Legality matters. And I'm so thankful my life was spared. But every preborn child deserves that same opportunity at love, at love and life. Well, I have just five minutes left, and I'm going to share my Rick Perry story. All right, because I'm in Texas, right? So I'm in the Citizens for Life film, The Gift of Life with the Governor Mike Huckabee. Mine is one of several stories featured in the film. So I had backstage passes to the premiere in glamorous Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> and it was held in between two presidential debates. They had four presidential candidates speaking at it. Michelle Bachman, Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, former Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich, um, former Senator, uh, why can't I think of his name all of a sudden? Oh, gosh. Yeah, Rick Santorum, thank you. <laughs> and former Texas Governor Rick Perry. So I had backstage passes and I introduced myself to each. I gave them my, I told them I'm in tonight's film. I gave them my DVDs, Conceived and Rape, A Story of Hope, and our group DVD, Accepting Cases of Rape, 12 Stories of Survival. And I gave them my business card, Conceived and Rape, Targeted for Abortion. You know, so. <laughs> and right away, Governor Perry was stunned. And he asked me, this is your story? And I, I had also told them each that I'm, I was a national spokeswoman for personhood. Right away, Santorum and Bachman said, oh, I signed the personhood pledge. I said, yes, I know. Thank you so much. It was a presidential pledge, came out two days before. They both signed it immediately. Perry and Gingrich had not signed it because they were both avowed to be rape exception candidates. And so he says, this is your story. And I shared with him a little bit of it. And he, he said, um, and I gave, you know, I'd given him that DVD. So he says, can I have your autograph? He says, no, I mean it. Here, make it out to my daughter. So I wrote 100% pro-life, Rebecca Kiesling. And then he asked me more questions, and I told him more of what I do as an attorney. And I have this global organization, Save the One, of over 1,200 now who were conceived in rape and mothers who became pregnant by rape and hundreds who were told by doctors to abort. And it's from the parable of the lost sheep that 
Jesus left the 99 to save the one. The, the good, he said the good shepherd leaves the 99 to save the one. For in the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. And uh, anyhow, so, and I told him like the advocacy I do for rape victims and their children. And he said, you know, you're my heroine. Wow, thank you so much. But it's funny you say that because my question for you is, would you be my hero? And he said, yes, yes, I, I would. But you make that rape exception. And he said, oh, wow, this is so powerful. This is so powerful. And he was thinking about it, and I didn't know how much time I'd have with him. Other people were waiting, and I said, I want to get my photo taken with you, but my battery's dead. And he said, what? My own personal photographer, come with me. And so we went to the green room where he took tons of photos, which he never sent me. <laughs> Although he used some film, some footage of us with Governor Huckabee in his ad campaign. Um, but he was looking at the camera, and he kept saying, I just can't imagine. I just can't imagine. And I looked up at him, and I explained, when you make that rape exception, that's like saying to me that I deserved the death penalty for the crime of my biological father. The US Supreme Court said that rapists don't deserve the death penalty. And in Coker, that was Coker v. Georgia, and in Kennedy v. Louisiana, they said that even for child molesters, it's cruel and unusual punishment. And he was nodding his head. So I asked him, so how is it that I deserved the death penalty for the crimes of the man who raped my mother? And he, and he said, and I, I asked him, you believe that I deserve the death penalty? And he said, no, no, I, I, I don't believe that. And I'm like, well, and he stopped me and he said, you know, tonight's event and this film are supposed to be all about changing hearts and minds. And right now, you're changing my heart. <laughs> and I thought, changing? Like, that's kind of a politician thing, right? You know? And I had, I'm like, what's that supposed to mean? And I had friends who were, um, telling me on Facebook that they were praying for me, saying, you're gonna have an Esther moment. I just know it for such a time as this. And I was not about to miss it. And so I challenged him. No more rape exceptions? And he looked me in the eyes and he promised no more rape exceptions. And I thought, yes. He went on to say that he had just never considered it from the perspective of someone like me. He had never put a face to the issue before. Not only did he sign the personhood pledge the next morning, but so did Newt Gingrich. And then over the next several weeks, he was on national television explaining why he signed it. And our conversation saying that he could not look me in the eyes and justify the rape exception anymore, that my story had pierced his heart. Well, nine months earlier, y'all had a rape exception in the sonogram bill. Didn't even say a woman had to see a sonogram of her baby, just that she had to be told she had the opportunity. And somehow it was so offensive to suggest such a thing to a rape victim. They had to add a rape exception to that. Like, rape victims are entitled to that same opportunity? That's pretty bad. And he went back and changed the culture in Texas where that was no longer the standard. And in Texas, you all passed some of the strongest laws in the nation, no exceptions. Alright, so I'm going to share one last, well, 
uh, two quick stories. My, my daughter, when she was six and a half, she asked me, Mom, how do you spell the word conceived? And I thought, why do you want to know how it's spelled conceived? It's a surprise, I'm writing a book. And she like stapled it and everything. And, and she wrote conceived in rape. She says, conceived in rape is not bad because that's my mom. Rape is bad and abortion is bad because they both hurt people. And I thought, why can't politicians just say that? <laughs> And then my birth mother, about 12 years ago, she called to wish me happy birthday and to tell me my grandmother had died on my birthday. We had a long heart to heart. I was out of state. I told her I'm going to fly home. I'm going to be there for you. And at the end of this long, heartfelt conversation, we were about to hang up. And all of a sudden, she cried out. She stopped me and she said, Rebecca, Rebecca, I just want to say, I'm so glad I had you. That was the best birthday gift ever. And just know, as if you have examples here tonight, that this is not a theoretical exercise. Well, this is a fundraiser. This is the biggest fundraising event of the year for the center. And it's not a theoretical exercise that maybe we might say, baby, just know that with your investment in this ministry tonight, there will be more and more moms like you saw here tonight. There will be women in your community, maybe in your families, who will one day be able to say to their children, I'm so glad I had you. Thank you. Terry, to come up here to tell you all thank you, Rebecca, for that sharing not only of your story but your faith. And a uh, wonderful opportunity for us to hear that. <laughs> 